Good evening. Welcome back to Winchester Academy's Winter Spring 2021 series. I am Ann Berger Linden and I am the Executive Director of Winchester Academy. Thank you for tuning in on this fine spring-like day. Thank you to the City of Wapaka and our producer Josh Werner for providing the space and technology to bring this program to you. Our next program will be in two weeks on Monday, March 22nd. Alan Haney will be giving us a talk on birds and climate change. Tonight's program is sponsored by Nancy Nelson. Nancy is being safer at home tonight. We do sh surely appreciate her support. Thank you, Nancy. We will have a Q&A session following Ian's presentation, Ian's, Richard and Jim's presentation tonight. Questions may be submitted via Facebook Live site or by telephone. The phone number is 715-942-9917. Again, that's 715-942-9917. And we will announce that number uh, again at the conclusion of the program uh, when we start our Q&A session. Our speakers tonight are Jim Bayman and Richard Wagner. We're joined here in the studio audience by their spouses, Betty and Kathy. Jim and Richard will be recounting the disaster of the Wyoega train derailment of 1996 from both a personal and professional perspective. Jim retired from the Wyoega Fire Department as chief in 2012. I'm sure the events he'll be discussing tonight stand out as a climax to his career with the department. Richard has been an active member of the Wyoega community both as a business owner and volunteer. He served on many boards, including the Wyoega Fremont School Board and our very own Winchester Academy Board of Trustees. Welcome, Jim and Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this evening, Jim Bayman and I, who were residents of Wyoiga at the time of the 1996 train derailment there, will present the stories of our experiences during that traumatic event. We will present in tag team fashion, starting with Jim, who was the acting fire chief and incident commander at the time. I will periodically inject my derailment experience as a local cheese factory manager then. Jim. Thank you, Richard. Time of the call, March 4th, 1996, 5.50 a.m. on a Monday morning. Report of a train crash at Highway 110 and County X at the northern city limits with multiple fires. All Wyoiga fire units responded. It looked like half of Wyoiga was on fire. On arrival, I called for mutual aid from Fremont Fire Department to the south side and Wapaka, Manawa, and Mukwa Fire Departments to the north side. I wanted Fremont to assist us and the other three to fight the fire from the north side. The roadway was completely blocked and I could not see the north side of the fire or the other fire departments. The railroad cars were piled up like dominoes. The west side of the feed mill was on fire, along with several rail cars. There was another structure to the west that was also on fire. We deployed two pumpers, flowing six attack lines. I contacted the City Public Works Department to start the water tower pumps as we were flowing 2,000 gallons a minute and draining the water towers. We soon realized that we were not making any headway. The fires continued to burn at the same rate. After about 20 minutes, I decided to concentrate on cooling the adjacent structures, which were near the fire. The main feed line for natural gas to the city ran directly under the crash site. We felt that that line may have been punctured with the gas feeding the fire. No car placards were viewable due to the pileup and fire. We didn't know that the rail cars had propane. The gas company responded to shut off gas to the city, thereby eliminating heat to 90% of our residents and commercial structures. 
By 6.30, we were receiving information from dispatch regarding the scope of the problem. 37 cars of an 81-car train had derailed. 14 cars had propane. Two cars had sodium hydroxide. Several had wood or paper products. Several were empty. Representatives from the railroad company, county hazmat, law enforcement, were in my mobile command post forwarding information. There was so much portable radio traffic that I needed to use three separate radios of different frequencies to monitor them all. The railroad representative indicated that there were propane cars on fire, and he said that the car construction could withstand the fire for about one and a half hours before an explosion could occur. We were already one hour into the fire. At 7 a.m., I ordered the fire attack to cease. We abandoned our lines and equipment and began to begin an evacuation of the area. Law enforcement, EMS, fire personnel began going door to door. The three fire departments on the north side did the same for the rural area. Residential, commercial, and industrial properties all had to be evacuated. We told people to leave in five minutes. We said we didn't know how long they would be gone. That lack of information led to other problems later. People listened to us and promptly left, but forgot to take their medications, money, and pets. Leaving without those items caused issues for many. Richard? On March 4th, 1996, I was beginning to wake up around 6.30 in my home located across town outside the Wyoiga, Wisconsin city limits, one mile south of the derailment when the phone rang. It was my sister, Pat Pater, who also lives in Wyoiga. She was all excited and was calling to tell me that due to a train derailment, the co-op gas station next to our Wyoiga Milk Products cheese plant blew up. I thought, my goodness. Um, and I looked out uh, my second-story bedroom window to the east and saw up in the sky a long stream of black smoke heading to the southeast. It was huge and looked something out of the Wizard of Oz. At that point, I thought, really no huge problem for me. Our cheese factory building near the co-op is all concrete construction, so it should be okay. I decided to take a shower and get uh, ready for my day. After grabbing some breakfast, I decided to go to work at the cheese plant. Well, I got halfway across town, and I was met by the entire fire department heading the other way south as they were evacuating their initial firefighting position. It was then that I thought to myself, this is not good. The firefighters paused briefly, and then they got the word to head even further south, away from the derailment site. And I thought again, this is really not good. So I turned around and headed south with everybody else and went back home. Interestingly, the fire department people did not stop until they were past my house. The evacuation was a stepped procedure due to the information that we had. The first evac orders for was for four blocks around the area. That was still in progress when we changed to eight blocks around the area. Before that was completed, we moved to a one and a half mile evac. The one and a half mile zone was determined from a previous propane disaster experience. Representatives from law enforcement, emergency government, fire, EMS, city government, hazmat, public works, and others met in the city library to try to lay out a plan. We quickly learned that the library was too small. We then selected the world-class manufacturing building on South Pine Street as our next option. 
We asked them if we could use their building for our command post, and they said yes. They moved their people to the production area where we were given the office area. The evacuation had continued. Two nursing homes with 100 patients each had executed their own evac plan successfully. A two-mile radius evacuation zone around the derailment site was designated. We contacted PTI Communications for additional phone lines at World Class. PTI set up 30 to 40 additional lines, but had to reroute service from Fremont as their Wyoiga facility was in the evac zone. At about 10.45 a.m., four hours into the evacuation, I was informed that the entire area had been evacuated. 1,700 citizens from, of Wyoiga and another two to 300 from outside the city were displaced. No one, myself included, expected they would be gone for 18 days. Emergency government had been notifying hotels in Wapaka, Stevens Point, and Appleton of our need for temporary lodging. Many people chose to go to a friend or relative's home. Now we had to try to find where all these people were so that we could account for them. The railroad stepped up and said that they would take care of all the lodging, meal, and clothing expenses for the displaced citizens. The Salvation Army and the Red Cross became involved almost immediately as well. The Wisconsin Departments of Emergency Government, Natural Resources, Department of Industry, Labor, Human Relations, the National Guard, and State Patrol responded to our command post. The federal government said the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Railroad Administration, and the National Transportation Safety Board. We were receiving more and more information on the volatility of the situation. The National Guard was used almost immediately for helicopter flights over the crash scene. After two overflights, I asked that the pilots be replaced with Vietnam-era pilots, since the first pilots were too nervous to fly close enough for good pictures. The railroad hired superior special services to help determine a plan of attack. After Superior's site inspection via those photos, they suggested letting the cars burn off, as there were 12 cars in the fire area. Each car contained 33,000 gallons of propane. It would be a mistake to extinguish the flames, even if we could, because propane is heavier than air, and it would have created ponds of vapor explosives. A no-fly zone of 10 miles around the site was established by the FAA. All roads within five miles of Wyoiga were blockaded. When I got home, I received a call from a friend working at Galloway Milk Company in Nina. He said he had heard on the news that there was some sort of disaster unfolding in Wyoiga, and if I needed a place to go with some milk of our, from our, coming in from our milk patrons into our cheese plant, that I could send a couple of trucks to Nina. No more than five minutes later, I got another call from one of our milk truck drivers saying that he could not get into town to unload because the roads into town were blockaded. There in this picture, you can see a stop sign right in the middle of what was then two-lane Highway 10 at Sunset Curve. There, drivers were being redirected onto the Highway 49 detour around the evacuation zone. So what should the milk hauler do? Well, I said, turn around and head for the Galloway Company in Nina. And then while I was thinking that that seemed way too easy, the thought also occurred to me, what was I going to do when the drivers of the next 50 loads of milk call me this day for alternate directions? Two million pounds of milk coming from 524 dairy farms in 15 counties had to go somewhere else each day for the next unknown number of days. 
I began calling other milk plants to see if they could process our patrons' milk. In the course of their routes, our milk trucks normally pass right by many other milk processing plants, so it would be convenient for our trucks to stop there and unload. In 1996, unlike now, there was a lot of competition for milk in Wisconsin, so when I called our competitors, it was quite heartwarming that they set competition off to the side and offered to do all they could to help us. Also, it uh, helped immensely that Kraft Foods Company, our primary cheese customer, called us upon hearing about the train derailment and evacuation, and they offered to guarantee purchase of any cheese made by these other plants using our patrons' milk. After I began calling other plant operators, I was interrupted by a policeman using a bullhorn while driving past our house, telling us to evacuate. At that point, evacuating immediately seemed all too inconvenient, especially because of all the calls I had to make. And besides, our son Jake had gone out in the woods skiing after he heard that school had been canceled. So I decided that instead of evacuating, I would close our curtains, shut off the lights, and hope the authorities would think that we were gone. <laughs> well, that didn't work because the officers soon came back to check on us. They seemed to know we were still home. So they pounded on the door and told us we had five minutes to leave. Now, we just assumed that uh, we would be allowed back home the same day. Uh, so we jumped in the car and left without packing anything. We also left our dog and two horses behind. Luckily, Jake got home just in time to jump in the car with us. This was the view of Wyiga looking back after we passed through the Highway 110 South Barricade and also from Highway 10 across the mill pond as we were heading for the home of my cousin Bob Wagner, who I was in business with and who lived on the back road to King west of Wapaka. We had decided that we would run the cheese company from there. Bob had been at the cheese plant at the time of the derailment. Initially, the 14 propane cars were stacked up like firewood at a campfire, the liquid propane leaking from one of the damaged tank cars began to vaporize and the gas drifted out until a spark set off a tremendous explosion and light flash that lit up the sky. <clears throat> At that point, a huge fire ensued north of the cheese plant around the feed mill next to the train tracks. Incidentally, we have to thank Ron Brooks, a dairy farmer and private pilot from Wapaka, who took these aerial pictures right after the derailment, but before the flight ban was put in effect over the area. After the firemen were unsuccessful at putting out the fire, and after they were ordered to evacuate back south towards the middle of town, Two fire officials began running through the cheese factory, ordering everybody to leave immediately. Factory supervisors ran ahead of the firemen and feverishly punched the big red panic buttons on all the equipment control panels in order to bring the cheese and whey operations to a quick stop. Cousin Bob made a quick exit from the office area, but not before grabbing the backup computer tapes on the way out. Those records had milk receipts, payroll information, and production records needed to make sure that dairy farm patrons and employees would keep getting paid. Day two, Tuesday. <coughs> We received a report of one person hurt during the initial power outage 
at an industrial site. The person tripped and fell, injuring both elbows. This was the only person injured during the entire train derailment. The city PD will conduct overnight patrols in the city beginning Tuesday night. It will be one car only and will stay south of the bridge. This patrol determined that the city power outage extended from Ann Street to the north. It appears the balance of the city has not been affected. The command center meetings were being held at 8 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., and midnight. We decided to hold regular press conferences with the intention of clarifying misinformation that the public was getting. We'll try to hold, try to hold those meetings at 9 a.m. each day. Helicopter flyovers indicated no change in the pressure fires, not ready to make entry to the derailment site. Wyoiga Fire has temporarily moved into the Fremont Fire Station. Wyoiga Fire will remain on duty 24 hours a day. Superior Special Services have been contacted by the railroad for site evaluation. Day 3, Wednesday. Due to continued false information getting out, we decided to hold daily public meetings in Appleton, Opaca, and Stevens Point. We also met with our command center staff and advised them that the only people authorized to talk to the public or media were the incident commander, the operations commander, or the public service or public information officer. Command has contacted MTEC Services from Texas and Hulsher Professional Services from Missouri. The railroad suggested these two companies as the best in the business. MTEC specializes in hazardous material recovery and Hulcher specializes in site operations. The command center is receiving an increasing number of calls regarding pets. PETA has indicated that an organized group would force entry into the city to retrieve any pets left behind. Command has not yet made a decision on the pets. PIO, Public Information Officer, relieved the video explaining to the media explaining and describing a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Governor Thompson visited our command post for a meeting. He wanted a timetable for this to end, but we could not provide one. He recommitted the state's help as we need it. As the governor spoke, Mayor Judy Wiesman listened as she continued to do a great job representing and leading the community members. Day four, Thursday. <clears throat> Light snow had fallen Wednesday night. The police patrol indicated several areas where foot tracks could be seen in the city, likely pet rescues. No attempt will be made to arrest anyone found in the city, but they will be strongly asked to leave. We are aware that we cannot legally keep them out. Fatigue is becoming a problem. We need more staff. The railroad has decided to completely relocate world-class manufacturing to Manawa. All machinery and supplies will be transported and set up at no cost to world-class. We needed this command, we needed the space. Our command staff had grown to about 35 people. World class needed to have full operations and were agreeable to the move. After the derailment ended, world class liked their setup in Manawa, and I had to convince the ownership to return back to Waiwiga. They did agree, and the railroad moved them back. Operations Command set up daily briefings for the command center staff. Incident Command set up briefings for the Wyoiga Fire Department. We reviewed plans for a pet rescue. We also set up a plan for farmers to temporarily re-enter the hot zone to care for their animals. The hot zone was the area closest to the derailment site and considered the most hazardous. Day 5, Friday. 
A pet rescue will be conducted by Wisconsin National Guard today. They will use armored personnel carriers to transport citizens to their individual homes. No rescues will be attempted north of the bridge. The pen owners will be accompanied by a guard member into the house and will not be permitted to remain in the home. The rescue took seven hours, but was successful. You'll notice the list of animals that were rescued. And there were some interesting ones. <clears throat> there was no derailment site work on Friday because of the rescue. Day 6, Saturday. Site operations began at 6 a.m. as there was enough daylight for the crew. Extensive video had been reviewed. A berm pit was created across County X on the Gordon Nemeth land. It was determined that all of the tank cars had been damaged in some way, so the crew could not transfer the gas to other rail cars. It needed to be burned off one car at a time. There was 469,000 gallons of propane, or a thousand pounds, excuse me, a million pounds by weight. This was the largest propane incident in American history. The city water system had to be shut down due to a large loss of water <coughs> in the water towers. Overflights and drive throughs by police did not see any water spillage. It was later determined that several pipes had broke, frozen and broken inside commercial businesses, and the running water was going down the internal sanitary sewer system. The city's engineers feared shutting down the system since much of it was very old, and they feared contamination and collapse. Fortunately, neither happened. While I settled in with my family at Bob's and his wife Sandy's home, the telephone company brought in extra phone lines for us, and I had a phone receiver basically glued to my ear for the next several days. Finding homes for all the patrons' milk day after day was a great challenge. Most of the milk ended up at about 14 other milk plants within 50 miles, including many loads that were received and then loaded onto other tankers to be shipped to plants in other states. Our field services quality control staff met at Bob's Place, too, and continued to service our patrons over the 18-day period that we were evacuated. As a result, we were able to maintain control of our milk supply so we would have it when we were able to restart the cheese-making operation at Waiwiga. During the evacuation, once things became a bit routine, the number of phone calls dropped off, that is, until a newspaper printed the statement that we were going to have a hard time paying our milk patrons for their milk. Then the phone lines lit up until we got the newspaper to print a retraction that the railroad company would cover all expenses. Otherwise, about all we could do was wait and adjust to life in homes away from home. Our 14-year-old daughter, Anna, made the best of the situation. She and her brother, Jake and their fellow Waiwiga High School students did resume classes put on by Waiwiga teachers at night at the Wapaka High School. Students from Waiwiga actually attended a total of 23 other schools during the evacuation. In addition to the Waiwiga Fremont school staff, uh, holding classes for displaced children in many other locations, such as the Best Western Motel in Stevens Point, the elementary school in Fremont, and St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and the Grandview Supper Club, both in Fremont. During the evacuation period, my wife Kathy was allowed through the highway barricades several times to feed and water our horses. 
She did use those opportunities to grab the dog and bring it to Bob's house. She also took measures to secure the house, primarily by making sure there would be no damage due to potential water pipe leaks given the freezing weather. Other city residents who didn't have the excuse of having to feed horses got into town anyway, using, among other avenues, animal passage culverts underneath Highway 10. As time passed, we did a lot of checking of the news, of course, and even ate free food from the Salvation Army. Our Waiwiga Church held services at the Fremont Community Center. The first week of the evacuation, we paid cheese company employees out of the m and Bank in Fremont. The next week, we had a temporary office set up for our secretaries in Wapaka from where we paid employees and conducted other office functions. Even though all of our 150 employees were paid on time, there were some interesting discussions between plant employees who were getting paid but not working and milk haulers who had to continue working for their pay. Day 7, Sunday, we began forming plans for re-entry. Several drafts over several days followed. Somehow the word got out that re-entry was going to begin soon. We had to go to our meetings with the public and tell them that that was not time yet. A morning report from the site crew indicated that water was running around the dam, eroding the dam's foundation. We sent in a crew to manually open the floodgates for the spring runoff as the automatic system had no power. As always, the site crew returned to the command post at 5 p.m. to review their progress with us. And as always, the crew members made their calls to their loved ones at 6 p.m. to advise that they were okay. Day 8, Monday. Another false information report was discovered about the contents of the railroad cars. The public information officer issued information to correct the record to the media. That correction was also given out at our regular public meetings. Site work was shut down <coughs> as two individuals from the EPA were missing near the site. A search was conducted and they were found and returned to the command post. I asked for their removal from our operation and they were replaced the next day. Day 9, Tuesday. Hot tapping is beginning today. Hot tapping is a process by which a hole is cut out of the low end of the tank car at the same time that a hole is cut out of the high end of the car, allowing the liquid propane to escape. That propane is gravity fed to the burn pit that was created and the liquid was then set on fire to burn off. At 11.30 a.m., the site crew heard hissing and noticed liquid propane leaking from a valve on one of the tank cars. The site was evacuated. After a lengthy meeting at command center, two crew members decided to return to the site and try to flare the likely pool of propane. They did not know exactly where the pool was, but the plan was to throw lit flares over the top of the tank cars to hopefully land in the pool. They thought that the pool would be small. They requested the Wyoiga Fire Department pumper, two paramedic ambulances, a medical helicopter, and an overhead aircraft that could help them direct their throws. It took eight flares before they hit the spot, but they had guessed right in that it was a small fire. The complete crew then went back to work. Day 10, Wednesday. We established a timeline for the farmers to attend to their animals. From 10 a.m., excuse me, from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., they would be allowed into their farms, but they must leave by 8 a.m. This timeline will delay site work. The first job by the site crew was to address a sodium hydroxide leak. The crew neutralized 9,400 gallons of sodium hydroxide with bags of citric acid. 
there was a concern about that solution making into the Wapaka River. The city is now under a boil water notice that will remain in place until the water system is determined to be safe. The sewage disposal plant is also shut down. Day 11, Thursday. Site crew reports that eight cars are gas-free. Six more to go. Work continues. Representatives from the Department of Natural Resources, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Railroad Administration, PTI Communications, Wisconsin Electric, Wisconsin Public Service, and a &R Pipeline were taken to the site to check damage to their systems. The public meetings continued at several sites. Day 12 and 13, Friday and Saturday. The site crew says that there are just two problem cars left. Four cars are being flared. A claims office is being set up in Appleton. Many of our residents went there during the evac. The railroad has indicated that it will cover all damage and expenses of those affected. Governor Thompson was upset about this because he said that it would set a precedent that could not be kept in the future. The president of the railroad indicated that the railroad caused the problems and the railroad will fix it. Day 14, Sunday, March 17th. The site crew executed an evacuation of the site at 8.40 a.m. One of the cars that was being worked on had an internal pressure increase from 75 pounds to 200 pounds of pressure in 10 minutes. The crew returned to the command center visibly shaken. They informed the IC and the operations commanders that they would not return to the site today or ever. We discussed what is the next step. The crew felt that we needed to contact a munitions expert from Louisiana that they had used in the past. His name was Billy Poe, and he was considered the best in the business. He would need to blow up the two remaining tank cars. I.C. asked, what if Billy said he couldn't or wouldn't do it? And the reply was that it would take an aircraft strike to blow it up. Billy arrived at 5 p.m., studied the situation, and felt that he could do the job. He had to attach explosives to two different locations on each of the tank cars. He would set off the charges manually while close enough to view the charges firsthand. It was important for him to see the first charge go off to time the second charge. Total radio silence must be observed. At 10 p.m., we witnessed the explosion from the command center, one and a quarter miles away and over the hill from the derailment site. We waited what seemed like a long time before we finally heard him say over the radio, it's finished, I'm okay. The 14 day fire was over. When the propane tanks were finally emptied and the green light given to go back into town, Everyone, especially Anna, were so happy to get back home and back to familiar surroundings. After 18 days away from our cheese factory, we were finally allowed to go in and start process the processing plant back up again. Amazingly, our cheese plant sustained only four small broken pipes due to freezing. About 17% of the 500 homes in town were not so lucky. In fact, there were so many leaking water pipes in town that the two water towers could not retain water, even though they were being fed by water pumps that could deliver 3,600 gallons per minute in total. So before our city water could be restored in order to clean up the plant equipment, all the homeowners had to have their homes assessed and water valves turned off. This process took three days because homeowners were not allowed back all at one time. They each had to be accompanied by a policeman, a plumber, a building contractor, a hazmat air sampling technician, and a representative from the gas company. There were 20 such teams. All this assured an orderly recovery process 
safety, and truthful reporting of damage. During the evacuation and the early days of the recovery, anyone in the evacuation zone had to wear photo ID, ID tags like this one. During the time of lack of water, we made cheese plant assessments and removed product to be discarded. Working with us were Department of Agriculture inspectors whose job was to determine what food products had to be discarded and what could be saved. They then had to make sure the two categories did not get mixed back together. These inspectors and their superiors did an exceptional job of having empathy for us and for our desire to get back up and running again. <clears throat> We had to dump a lot of product. The cheese and milk developed some interesting colors in the vats due to yeast and mold growth. Cheese was stirred on this salting table for days until it turned stiff and the agitators popped out. Here's a picture of Jake helping clean up a floor that was pretty messy. Employees had to climb into our cheddaring machine to cut the cheese out by hand. We put a total of about 170,000 pounds of this and other cheese in these barrels. This product was subsequently used for fish bait. We land applied as fertilizer about 450,000 pounds of milk in receiving silos. At that point, it was like buttermilk. We sucked out from holding tanks around 250,000 pounds of whey concentrate and land applied this and also a couple hundred thousand pounds of raw whey and a truckload of cream, all onto land permitted for the spreading of this type of material. We happen to have plenty of land already permitted. Noteworthy and very moving was the fact that our Department of Natural Resources contact called us to let us know that if we needed more land, he would find it and help however he could. We had liquid in the cleaning tank so we could circulate, soften up, and pre-clean most equipment. Only a few pump impellers and seals had to be replaced due to wear from running dry. On Friday morning of the third week after the evacuation, water pressure came on, albeit under a boil order that was to last two days as an alternative uh, to uh, boiling, the Ag Department did allow us to simply test the water to assure a residual chlorine level, which was around two parts per million. So on that 18th day of the evacuation, we cleaned up and began taking milk back in. On the 19th day, we started to make cheese and whey products again, all back to normal. Since the electricity remained on throughout the evacuation, our sewage treatment plant aeration system kept producing foam. This activated sludge overflowed onto the ground, though it created no real environmental issue because the excess is normally land spread anyway. As far as product that was saved, here is a picture of Billy Poe the demolitions expert who controlled the final explosion that emptied out the last two propane cars. He wanted to have his picture taken with all the cheese that he heard was saved. One million pounds of fresh cheese at the start of the cooling process in 700 pound square wooden barrels was found to be between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit in our pre-cooler. 
because this cheese was over 50 degrees, it was sampled and tested for salmonella and listeria pathogenic bacteria and pH. All tests were okay, and this product was sold for unlimited use. About 12 million pounds of cheese in long hold storage, which never got above 50 degrees and suffered no obvious ill effects, was judged to be okay. Two million pounds of dried whey products on site were judged to also be okay. It helped again that the fumes from the propane fire were considered non-toxic. Wisconsin Central Railroad had their own mess to clean up. I really felt for them, and it certainly helped everyone's disposition that the railroad promised to cover all expenses caused by the wreck. The total cost of the entire incident to the railroad and their insurance carriers was somewhere around $28 million. This included a $50 per day payment for each person evacuated plus coverage for any of their property damage. Our family pooled our per diem money that we got and bought a new, bigger TV set. The damage to homes overall was not that great, with some exceptions, including this home, just over the boundary into the township of Waiwiga, where the gas heat was off, but the electric well pump kept pumping when pipes froze and broke. We were surprised that the railroad insurance people <clears throat> not only covered our cheese business expenses, but in addition, they told us they would also cover our expected profit for the month of March 1996. Well, that month coincidentally turned out financially to actually be fairly good. One of my most memorable impressions of the derailment event was the astounding outpouring of empathy, prayers, and offers of help that simply appeared in waves at the time. I'm sure the management of Wisconsin Central Railroad had similar impressions because a month later they took out a full-page Post Crescent ad which listed and thanked 280 organizations and individuals who stepped up and offered support and services during the evacuation. They alluded to there being even many more unnamed. Just a follow-up, in 2001, Wisconsin Central Railroad sold its 2,850 miles of track to Canadian National Railroad. Canadian National has 20,400 miles of track and is publicly traded and has as its largest single shareholder, Mr. Bill Gates. Speaking of Canada, our cheese business was sold in 2008 to AgriPur Dairy Cooperative based in Quebec, Canada. AgriPur operates 39 plants in Canada and the U.S., and we are happy to report that AgriPur continues to invest and grow in our community of Waiwiga. For those of you interested in additional information about the Waiwiga train derailment, the Waiwiga Historical Society has set up a nice display in the Waiwiga Municipal Building. Also, of course, are, there are lots of postings about the derailment on the Internet, and Jim Bayman here has a wonderful collection of paper clippings and much more information about the derailment. Bill and Cindy Wallace at Dockside Design in Waiwiga made shirts saying, I survived the great Waiwiga train wreck and evacuation, along with train whistles produced for a fundraiser. From that, they gave a total of $4,000 to the Salvation Army and the local fire department and emergency medical service. 
On June 23, 1996, the Salvation Army sponsored a big party for all the Waiwiga area people to celebrate being back on track, no pun intended. And finally, while propane tank cars are still rolling by Waiwiga, they don't have as many such cars right in a row nowadays as they used to. Thanks very much for your attention. At this time, I guess we'll take uh, questions. Okay. Um, for those of you who might want to call in a question, that phone number is 715-942-9917. You can also submit uh, comments or questions via our Facebook live stream page. Does anybody in our studio audience have a question? Kathy? Speak into the microphone. I was just wondering if you had your cows at that point. No, luckily. Yeah, because you talked about two horses. I didn't know how many cows you have. Like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Anything else? Good question. I came up with a few during the, the, the program myself. Um, so this one is for Richard. Um, this event occurred before I think anybody had cell phones. So what method of communication did you use with your milk truck drivers? Actually, uh, they had cell phones at that time. They did. They did, yeah. Yeah, oh, they wow. were very hefty packs, uh, battery packs and uh, large cell phones at that point in time. Okay, and then I forget if um, Jim or Richard addressed this, but um, you mentioned, I think it was Jim, that the farmers worked from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m. What was the r rationale for that and not, not having them work during the day? We wanted, we wanted every attempt that we could to unload that propane. And we felt it was the safest time for the farmers to be able to go in to work at night. They were, they were very, very, very concerned about their animals. And this was, we felt, the most logical time that we could get them in um, because if no work was being done at the site, it was probably more stable. Okay. And then I'm just kind of wowed by the expertise you have. What um, special training? I mean, you were basically a volunteer firefighter department? Not basically, actually. So... <laughs> I mean, how well prepared? It seems like you were very well prepared to deal with this. Did, who was the, the top dog in the response team? Well, I was the incident commander. You were. Wonderful. Everything had to run through me. And the reason for that was a statutory requirement. The fire chief in Wisconsin is responsible for every activity concerning that fire while it is still burning. I didn't know... I didn't understand it quite that way, and I would have been uh, very pleased to pass off that responsibility uh, as we got into this, but my job was to do that, and um, I took it very seriously, but I had a tremendous number of people with expertise in a number of different areas that were my advisors. I knew little about these types of incidents, but I learned quickly. Great. Well, congratulations. Um, we got a call from Texas. Uh, what caused the derailment? Was that ever determined? It was. Uh, years later, the National Transportation Safety Board determined that um, there was a flaw in one of the rails right where it meets um, the nail holes, if you will, that are put in to hold it in place. Interestingly enough, uh, I thought the railroad said it was either 30 or 45 days prior to that, all the rails had been inspected, um, and they found no problems. This apparent little minute flaw that had been in place for 20, 25 years chose that particular moment to fail and led to the mess that we had. So it was, I'm sure that the 
individual who made that particular track um, was proud of it 30 years before that. But we had chose that point in time to fail. Okay, here's a question from our Facebook feed. Um, I had a friend who sneaked in during the do not enter time because of his pets, and he managed to take them out before the general public was permitted to do so. Do you have an estimate of how many other people might have done that? I do not. I, I do, we, do, we don't have an estimate. We know that there were a number of people that did that. As I indicated, uh, we had that snowfall, and that snowfall gave away tracks for um, in a lot of different areas. Um, I did show you the number of, of uh, pets that were rescued. And interestingly enough, there was only 34 pets registered in the city where we got that time. So the, a lot of these pets uh, weren't, <laughs> weren't well known. But um, I, I'm sure that there were, I, I'm sure that there were dozens of people that tried to get in and get their pets. How many people were um, hospitalized or died as a result of this event? None. That's amazing. No people were hospitalized or died. Now, there was a lady who passed away during the bus ride in to the reentry. Uh, an elderly lady who, my guess is that she was just overcome with emotion, um, wondering what her house was going to look like. But she died on the bus that, that day. Um, good friend of mine. Um, but that was the only um, death during the entire program. And as I mentioned, one person injured their elbows, but my understanding was they did not have to receive any medical treatment either. How about Mr. Harris? Mr. Harris passed away too. Yeah, but he wasn't around here. He wasn't. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's another Facebook question. Do you feel that this event brought the community closer together? No, we were all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Evacuate. <laughs> Yes, when we actually started, I think a lot of people uh, um, found that their circumstances weren't maybe as dire as what they thought. They felt um, a, uh, a friendship with a lot of people. They came in in, in, a, seri in, in a calculated series on buses, and so that those particular people probably, maybe some of them hadn't met each other before this particular situation. So um, I'm sure they, when they discovered that their homes were um, minor damage or little damage or no damage, um, um, they probably felt comfortable, more comfortable with the people that they were with on the bus ride back out. So <coughs> I, I think in a way, um, also, at that time, there was an awful lot of our residents that knew each other. We had a lot of uh, um, homeowners um, that had lived there for a long period of their life. So many of them were friends even you know, before that. Um, I think that was only maybe enhanced by the fact that they all had to go through this experience together. We just had a call from a gentleman in Manaqua, Wisconsin, who was a dispatcher during the uh, uh, train uh, derailment. And he just wanted to emphasize that uh, the dispatch center was receiving calls worldwide from people wanting to help, wanting to uh, offer some assistance, that uh, calls were coming in from uh, all around the world. And then he had one uh, question is that Billy, the guy that did the, uh, the explosion work, is he still alive and moving around? You mean today? Today. I do not know. Uh, my, my, my contact with Billy began and ended that same day. Okay. He, flew, he, flew, he was contacted in the morning, flew in from Louisiana, uh, didn't really, there was no social time. We just did the studying and what needed to be done. 
and he was back on a plane later that evening. He ate, he ate a little cheese on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> During the evacuation, how was it handled if people refused to leave their homes? That's an interesting question. Um, 99% of the people left immediately, willingly. And I attribute that to the fact that because we were a small town and because the firemen knew the people that they were knocking on the doors with, those people trusted them and trusted in their request. I did get a couple of radio calls, um, handheld radio calls from my firemen who said, um, Joe or Bill don't think they need to leave. And so I asked my firemen to give them the radio so I could talk to them. And I simply told them, you know, this is a very, very serious situation and um, you need to leave. Believe me, you need to leave. And in those two or three cases that I had to do that, they did. They did leave. So we really didn't have any resistance whatsoever. And here's another one. Can you uh, speak further about the resident reimbursement by the railroad? Exactly what was covered and how and when did the reimbursement happen? Well, uh, there was reimbursement ongoing during the evacuation in order to pay our employees and milk patrons, I know, uh, and uh, as Jim had mentioned, they, they set up payment centers and you could go down and, and uh, show the railroad what your damages were and then uh, also receive the per diem afterwards. So it was, it was all handled very quickly and, and uh, I don't know if there were any problems. Jim, do you know? I think 95, maybe 98 percent of the community was able to settle right there at those at those centers. There's a few people that had uh, unusual claims, if you will, uh, that ended up, my understanding, in litigation. However, I was not privy to any results of any of that litigation, so I don't know how those came out. How long did it take for the railroad to clean up? the aftermath? The fire ended on the 14th day. The railroad site was cleaned up on the 16th day before the people ever got back into the city. Oh. They had trains there. They loaded them on. They hauled the damaged cars to a yard in Green Bay, and <coughs> there they cut them apart and disposed of them. So on the it was first, a very, very quick process. Uh, Jim, I had read that on the first day back to school, students that lived on the other side of the track had to wait for a train to go by. <laughs> <laughs> Did the changes to the lineup of propane, propane cars change as a result of this accident? The short answer is yes. Um, that was one of the things that came out that the National Transportation Safety Board demanded be done. Um, the railroad understood why. It was a lot of inconvenience for them. But because we had 14 cars in this particular case, all in a row, tumbling off the tracks, they felt it'd be better if they could put two or three or four cars in a row and then other cars in between. And I think to this day, they do spread them out much better than what they did then. Were there any concerns about looting or, um, you know, as all these homes and businesses were vacant that, you know, other parties might come in and do some bad stuff? Yes, our, our local police department did have that feeling and were concerned about that. And that's why they insisted on going back in and doing these um, checks during the course of uh, the first three, four days, but what they found was nothing. Um, we were also concerned that 
maybe we would have a fire start because somebody left and left a coffee pot on. And all of a sudden, we have an issue with a house fire. But even that, luckily, didn't happen. So um, there was a concern, but it turned out to be something that didn't happen. Apparently, even those people who might have considered being a bad guy decided it was too dangerous. So the city didn't lose power during this period of time? About half of the city did. Because I was just wondering about those farmers that went back. I know that they have machines that help with milking if they didn't have, and if they're in the barns and it was dark, I was just curious about that. There was, the power came into the city from two different locations, or two different directions. Actually three, I guess. Was it three then? Yeah. Okay. And it's unknown to us, uh, the power company probably knew, exactly which direction it was flowing from. So sometimes it could backfeed if one area was shut down. Um, but there was no adjustments made or no repairs made to the system for quite some time. So if you were lucky enough to have power, you were all right. But um, my mother's house, for example, who lives in the city, she had um, full power the full time, and she had fuel oil for heat. So it was like she closed the door, and when you opened back up, it was just as good as the day that she left. But others were not quite so lucky. Um, I don't know. I, I, I didn't hear of a lot of farmers that lost electricity, um, and I don't know why. Well, that's lucky. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> The only house that I'm aware of is the one that Richard showed on the screen. Um, it was in, technically it was in the town of Waiwega, it wasn't in the city of Waiwega, but for the reasons that Richard had stated, that the, uh, uh, the pumps kept pumping water, even though the lines had been broken and frozen, and filled up the basement, and the water was running out the doors and windows. And the house was simply unrepairable. The railroad, my understanding is, took care of that too. I think it's commendable that you were able to use your products that were no longer edible for on the fields and, you know, the ways you listed. I, that's just commendable that that could be done. I hate throwing things out, you know. I mean, even during this pandemic, we heard that farmers were just letting milk run, run out because they didn't know what to do with it to begin with. Mm -hmm. That obviously got changed, but it was just a, a crying shame. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kathy. So, Jim, did you become um, a guest speaker at fire department conventions all over the country after this? Uh, yes, I was contacted a few times. Uh, I spoke in Illinois, in Iowa, in South Dakota. Um, I spoke three or four places in Wisconsin. Um, it was... All fire, or I should say, emergency services related, um, and they were all interested. <clears throat> I had uh, the opportunity to speak in South Dakota at what they called their winter muster, and I was on in the morning speaking on a Saturday, and in the afternoon, a a um, chief from um, Orange County, California, was going to be talk about the riots that they had there. And as we were passing each other in the hallway, he, after I got done with my presentation, he says to me, boy, I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, I don't know. It was pretty impressive, the, the riots that they had in Orange County. So I, I don't know um, what it was, but I had, I had an opportunity to speak to a number of different organizations and and they all seemed uh, interested in what I had to say. Well, this was certainly interesting for everybody who tuned in here. Um, I think this is probably a record attendance that we can evaluate for our virtual programs. Uh, it's hard to really know how many people are tuning in because when you're on a screen, you might have two or three or four people all watching at the same time. And um, we're actually available through four different platforms and only two of them are are giving us the 
the number of connections, the Win TV and the WILW radio. Um, we have no way of knowing how many people are out there except for comments that we get um, via email or bumping into somebody in the grocery store. So anyway, um, we had a, a lot of wonderful comments on our Facebook page thanking you for a, a great program. Okay, so here was the last question that came in. Um, did you have a plan for the worst case scenario or if the worst case scenario happened? And I guess that would be some kind of an uncontrolled explosion. To a degree, the first morning, no, we had no plan. It was all reaction. Um, it was later, you might recall, when I talked about uh, the first site evacuation and the fact that the, the uh, site crew had to go back and throw flares. Then we would put a plan together. In case something went haywire, when we went to the site, this is what we would do. Um, so our fire departments and our EMS um, had to stand by on a number of occasions planning for the worst. Um, but specifically, it was for a particular situation, not the entire situation. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap it up with that response. Do you guys have any final words you want to share with the audience? I was a lot younger 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, thank, thank, Weren't we uh, all? Thank you to everybody that uh, helped us out. I just wanted to say that this is the first program that I've been to for Winchester Academy in a year. And I'm delighted to be here to hear you. <laughs>